Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. You have the words of life. We have no place else to go. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into truth, who convicts us of our wrong, who encourages us when we do right. We ask you, please, continue. Don't give up on us, God. Even though we're slow to learn, hard-hearted, stiff-necked, Lord, please don't give up on us. We need you so desperately, so terribly do we need you. Holy Spirit, lead and guide us. God, change lives today. I just, I just know there's some people in here, today's message is really going to um, move on their hearts. God, please go ahead of us and defeat the plan of the enemy. God, uh, the person who is going to call at just the wrong time, God, shut that phone off, God. And um, if there's a person that needs to be here, bring them here, God. Bring them here right now. Please, God, we surrender. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For the sake of your people, God. For the sake of those, as your word says, who are the excellent ones on the earth in whom is all your delight. The person that's here that you delight in, that they don't even know it, God, change their lives. In Christ's name, amen. Last week we looked at John chapter 20 and the Lord Jesus appeared and he breathed a breath on his apostles and my interpretation of that was that was their salvation experience because Christ had now risen from the dead and he was able to bring salvation. He breathed on them. Some scholars and some Bible people would, would disagree with that but I want to explain to you why I believe that was salvation, why that is, was Chuck Smith's theory on that as well. Verse 21, chapter 21, verse 1, says, after these things. Now, you could circle that word for after these things, and right next to it you could write metatauta, M-E-T-A-T-A-U-T-A, -A -A, metatauta. That is a phrase incorporated in the book of Revelation. This is extremely important, and I've been telling you all through the book of John that the theory that the Apostle John wrote the book of John after he wrote the book of Revelation is extremely, it, it, it makes sense here today. You'll understand why as we get through the chapter. But that phrase, metatauta, in the Greek, it means after these things. It is a a literally a prescription to know this occurred after this, that occurred after this. It literally lays out the book of Revelation. That phrase is, occurs a bunch of times in the book of Revelation and literally gives you the layout of the book. Here, though, it's important to know because he incorporated basically the same language after he left the Isle of Patmos, before he was boiled in oil according to uh, church tradition and still not yet put to death, the Apostle John writes these things some 30 to 40 years after these events occurred. With that thought in mind, because that kind of puts things together into perspective, metatauta, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. And the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, what did he say to them? He was just breathed on. He just saw the risen Christ. Christ just rose from the dead. Oh my goodness. Exactly as he predicted. He said now, after receiving this powerful anointing, I am going to share the love of Christ with everybody. I am going to go where, I will go wherever God send me. No. He said, I'm going fishing. What does that mean, I'm going fishing? It's very simple. This is one of the reasons why I believe that breath that he received was the breath of salvation. Now, there's nothing wrong with going fishing, mind you, if you're a fisherman here. There you are. 
Mike over there. Mike's so much a fisherman, he didn't even raise his hands. He's like, yeah, well, everybody knows. <laughs> Could I have your boat? <laughs> I'm going fishing, he says. And then the other apostles, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night caught nothing. Now, please, again, let me give you the visual here. Keep something in mind that these men were fishermen. They had a family business. They had employees. When they got into a boat, sometimes we have this idea that there they are rowing on the Sea of Tiberias. Oh, let's go fishing, and they throw out their line. That's not how it was. They had a big boat. Probably 15, 20 people might have been on it. He said, listen, what am I going to do? Think about this. The guy that you've been following is dead. He just rose from the dead, and I don't think it's really sunk in yet. So he's like, well, what do we do now? I guess we'll just go fish. I, I guess I'm just going back to my life. Now, there's a weird perfection to that. Let me tell you a quick testimony. And this is important to some folks here that live in a certain fearful unexpectation of the future. You come to church and you receive salvation. It was 1997. I was in prison. I was in federal prison. And I had gotten arrested because I was importing and exporting um, reptiles and amphibians from different countries. And one of the countries I imported animals from was a country called Tanzania in Africa. Well, a few months after I imported these animals, the federal agents came to me and they said, uh, Mr. Gitman, um, these tortoises that you brought in, they were illegal. And I said, what do you mean they were illegal? So the paperwork that you imported them with was no good. It was forged. So well, I didn't forge it. Well, we know you didn't forge it. But you sold the animals. So what are you telling me for? Go. No, no. Your responsibility. It's like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You let the animals come in the country. Somehow, that argument didn't sit well with them. The reason I tell you that story is because while I was in prison, I had this guy I had just gotten saved just Actually, through that whole thing, that's how God broke my heart completely. And this pastor, John Chanel, used to come up and see me about once a month. And a few months in, when I finally said, you know what, I, 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 I'm going to get serious about God. That's what I'm going to do. But this fear kept knocking on my heart. I was like, man, if I just, I'm doing prison time for importing tortoises. All the crap I did in my life, and I'm, I'm in jail for tortoises. <laughs> Great stories, by the way. Great stories around that, where the Italians would say to me, come here. What are you doing here? I uh, got arrested for selling tortoises. What's a tortoise why? No, no, tortoise. Tortoise why? Tor 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 tortoise why? What is that? That's a turtle that lives on land. So why don't they call it a turtle? <laughs> Vinny, I got things to do. I can't sit here and talk about this with you every single day. I think you're a rat. Because nobody goes to prison for selling tortoise I'm not a rat. I'm just in. I'll see you later, Vinny. Or it was a brother named Pompano Joe. Ryan! No, no, this is Fort Lauderdale. Ryan! Ryan, come here! Come here, Ryan! You're my first wife friend. You gotta tell my mama. Come here. Come here. Mama, mama, this is my first wife friend. His name Ryan. Mama, I ain't getting out of prison. I ain't never leaving no more. Why? They put him in jail for selling turtles. <laughs> they put a brother in jail for nothing no more. I'm staying here. Great stories like that. Tons of them. I was there for a year. I got lots of them. You want to hear another one? No. No, no. But through that fear, that kind of started to grip me, and I had this new life. So I had this new idea. I had this idea, now that I'm a Christian, maybe I should, like, find a job at a church. Um, maybe I should start wearing a, a tunic everywhere. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I should do something different than I was doing. And I told Pastor Ch John, I said, Pastor John, I, I don't want to work at my store. I, ha I had a business. 
I owned a business. I was like, I told them, I'm going to, you think they can hire me at the church because I don't want to get out in my business. And this little tiny guy, little tiny ball guy, probably at the time, he was probably in his 70s. Now he's got to be close to 90, right? Is he, he's got to be close to 90, right? He's still alive, bless his heart. He looked at me and he goes, hey, hey, look at me. You get out and you go back and run your business. And I'm like, yeah, but if they're going to, yeah, I want to hear this fear and this nonsense. You bloom where you're planted. You bloom where you're planted. That's a word for somebody. Maybe a lot of people here. You take your Christianity. You don't have to go get a job in a church. You don't have to quit your job because you don't think it. You bloom where you're planted. Do you know how many people say, Ryan, how come you don't go full-time ministry? Um, Excuse me. I'm in full-time ministry. My whole life is ministry. Well, no, no, that's not, I didn't mean no disrespect. Why don't you, like, just work at the church and do what? Sit around and wait for somebody to call? Well, maybe, listen, I don't want to quit my job. I love my job now. I have bloomed where I was planted. And in my job, I get to meet people who don't know the Lord. And those are my favorite people. And at the gym, I get to meet people who don't know the Lord. And those are my favorite people. I don't ever want to quit my job and go into full-time ministry. I like my full-time ministry job now. Amen? So for you here that are wondering, what's next? Bloom where you're planted, says John Cinelli. They decided to go fishing, and I like that. Get right back to business. Say, get back to business. But they went fishing all night, and they caught nothing. Now, wasn't there another time when Peter went fishing and caught nothing? You guys remember all the way back? I think it's chronicled in Luke. And then some guy (laughs) appears that he doesn't know and says, Hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Reminds me of this great story. Years ago, me and my wife used to go up to Jupiter and uh, and Juneau Beach. And I used to fish while she sat on the beach. And I'm not big for sunbathing, but I used to go fishing. And now what happens is you got this big Juneau Pier. Anybody been in Juneau Pier? It's a big pier, right? But from one side to the other, it's only about 15, 20 feet. So what happens, though, is everybody's on this fishing, and everybody's fishing, right? All of a sudden, somebody over there catches fish, everybody reels it up, goes over here. Like, you know it's the same underneath there, it's the same. (laughs) Throw your your net on the other side of the boat. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. But it ended a funny way, if you remember the book of Luke. They catch in this gigantic haul of fish, right? And then after they go back to the shore, Peter is kind of like, he's sitting there contemplating what just happened, and he's kind of freaked out. And and I'm paraphrasing, but the Lord says, you okay, man? And he looks up at God and just, just go away from me, please. I got to process this. I'm I'm a foul man. He was blown away at the power of God. It just came near him. It just touched him in a way he never experienced. And full brokenness was upon him. It hadn't sank through him yet, but it was upon him. He was a prideful, wealthy, strong man. And all of a sudden, everything that he thought he knew about life had just come crashing down. I don't know if you remember that. Just depart from me, please. I'm unclean. Let me figure this out first. I don't even know what happened yet. You guys remember? Verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Please, please, please keep that on the front of your brain. The disciples did not know it was Jesus. Extremely important. We're going to come back to that at the end of the study. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? Now the actual implication of that word children is like fellas. Hey fellas, you got any food? And they answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast the net, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. The same thing that happened a few months ago, or should I say three years ago. 
You ever do that? You ever um, kind of walk away from the Lord because it doesn't feel like he's there? And then all of a sudden you have an experience that reminds you of something else? What's your... It's kind of a weird thing. Accepting the Lord Jesus is like tying yourself to a rubber band. And you can go... And all of a sudden you trip and bang. And some people live their whole lives stretched out on that rubber band. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know is the Apostle John, and we're going to find out why we know that soon, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Now, I want to remind you that just a couple weeks ago, we saw that Simon Peter, the, the Lord Jesus named him Peter, which means Petra in the Greek, which is rocky, like a little rock. You are a little rock. But now they're calling him Simon Peter, back to his original name before Christ. Stay with that thought. And he it says he put, took his, like they used to have a tunic and then almost like rain gear, a fishing gear. He took off his fishing gear. It's the morning. They're finished. Now all of a sudden he puts it back on and he jumps into the sea. Now why did he jump into the sea? Would he want to go and see that it was God or was he not wanted the Lord to see him? But either way, can you see this big burly guy just barreling into the sea. I find that. Therefore, the disciples put it, he jumped into the sea. Verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, so apparently there's two boats. They were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals. That phrase appears two times in the book of John. Does anybody remember where the first time it appeared? when he was sitting around the fire talking about how he didn't know the Lord. The fire of coals. I don't remember the phrase in Greek, but it's the only two times it occurs. Once he's sitting there talking, hey, you were with him, weren't you? No, I don't know the man. Then again, a fire of coals. Hey, your accent, I could tell you're from Gal... I said I don't know the guy! Now all of a sudden, hey, cast your net on the other side. All these fish, reminder. Fire of coals, he's all of a sudden making breakfast for them. Mm, 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 mm. They had fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land. Now I find one miraculous thing. Seven guys couldn't pull that net into a boat, and all of a sudden Peter pulls it up on the land. That's very interesting. Full of large fish, 153. Now, quick left turn. Scholars for literally hundreds and hundreds of years are trying to figure out what 153 means. Is there a significance there? Now, I wrote some of these things down, and I didn't put them on the board again because that's the way I am. There was a man named Cyril of Alexander, just a couple hundred years after, represented, representing God in the church. He said 100 was the number of the fullness of the Gentiles. It makes no sense, whatever. 50 was the remnant of Israel. 3 was the Trinity. Augustine, one of the founding fathers of the church, said 10 was the number of the law. 7 was the number of grace. 10 plus 7 equals 17. 1, 5, 3, 17. 15 plus 3. Didn't make any sense either. Jerome, another fa- one of the founding fathers of the church, an ancient belief that there were 153 different kinds of fish in the sea. Eh, wrong answer. However, there's a new theory that's very interesting. There's a word in Hebrew called remez. Remez is like something what you see in the Hebrew that is almost like a, a, a deep pit that you can a positive pit that you could fall into that is a reminder of things that has more meanings, almost like a double prophecy, a remez, the Jews call it. 
Now, considering that the Dead Sea Scrolls predate the Masoretic, Masoretic influence by many centuries, and given that these three extra Psalms were commonly read, you guys know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? Okay. In certain caves, the, what's called the Qumran, not the Quran, but the Qumran, there was a cave 11. There was 153 Psalms originally in the text that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that predated the current version of the Bible we have. So do we call them three lost Psalms? No, we don't. But to those people who apparently knew what the Dead Sea Scrolls were, there might have been 153, 153. That's just like the Psalms. Best guess. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got for you on that one. Otherwise, I have no idea why there was 153 fish. I wish I had more. You guys are really hoping for something more. I could see it in your eyes. And I left you kind of feeling like, yeah, tell another story, because that sucked. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all there was. <laughs> now is the third time, verse 14, Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, what did he call him? What did he name him before he got converted? Peter. He's calling him by his name before. When, when Simon Peter disavowed God, he literally lost his commission. If you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father is in heaven. Right now, Peter is a lost soul. He has a hunger in his heart. Remember what I said? If you believe in vain a couple weeks ago, we talked about a belief that was in vain. It, it takes more than just believing that Christ existed. There's a believing faith that pulls you to him. It certainly takes more than going to church to know the Lord, right? This is so, this is freaky, guys. You've got to really buckle up for this. This is a little freaky. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Please give me your attention. Let me explain to you. In Luke 22, the Lord Jesus said to Simon Peter, he said to Peter at the time, Peter says to him, I'll follow you anywhere, even to death. I'll die for you, and I'll die with you. And the Lord says to him, after you're converted, I want you to go strengthen the brethren. After you're converted. That had to sound really weird, but the Lord obviously knew this denial would happen, and he would lose his commission can't lose your salvation, especially since now the Lord has risen. But there's definitely a weirder thing going on here that doesn't have a whole lot of explanation. Now, all of a sudden, he has this three-pointed discussion with him. And he says to him, i got to find the exact words. Do you love me? Without having a little glimpse into the Greek, you must understand that in Greek, in Greek there is like five words for love. We're going to look at two. In Greek you don't say, wow, I love ice cream. Mom, I love you. Joy, I love you. I just said love three different ways, didn't I? I don't love my mama the same way I love ice cream. And I certainly don't love ice cream the same way I love my wife. Greek makes a very increased distinction there. And here's how it does. The word agapeo, 
Agape, the active version of it, agapeo, means do you, when the Lord Jesus says, Simon, do you agapeo me? Meaning, do you love me without inhibition? Do you love me without, do you, are you fully dedicated to me now? Because obviously you weren't before. I'm not seeing into this. This is what the language suggests. And then the word phileo, which means, I really like you. You're my boy. You're my friend. The Lord says to Simon Peter, again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agapeo me? Do you give me your entire heart? Are you committed to this thing or not? And Simon Peter says to him, we're really cool. Do you love me? I really like you. Wow. Guys, the application of this to our own lives is so freaking scary. Do you understand that? The Lord allows these things to happen in our lives, and he says to us every day, Alex, son of Marcos, do you agapeo me? Ryan, son of Ron, everything? I can't. I can't honestly say that. Because Peter already did this, guys. He already did this. I'll die for you. I'm cutting this guy's head off. I'm giving you everything. It's it. It's us. Me and you together. Peter's got it now. Peter came to the place that all of us have to find ourselves in. A weakness and an honesty. I try. I try so hard. I wake up in the morning. I'm telling you, I wake up fully dedicated. Man, I'm in the shower. I'm in the warrior spirit on me. I'm going to slay the world today. Man, by the time I'm in my car, I'm already distracted with phone calls and oh, busyness. By the time I'm at work, I've already killed like four people on the way there. And now I'm like, Lord, I really like you, and it's like 9 o'clock, and I'm already in trouble. <laughs> Peter, at least, the Lord says, Peter, do you love me with everything? And he says, no, I really like you with a little. And he says to him a second time, listen, <laughs> he says, Oh, and then he says to him, feed my lambs, after he says, I really like you. And that word for feed my lambs is this word, boski, which is what's called an imperative participle, meaning it goes on and on and on. Don't ever stop. You can't turn your back on this calling, he says to him. If you really like me, you know how you get over really liking into complete dedication by serving me continually. Don't turn away anymore. Don't turn away. Continually feed my lambs, my baby sheep. And then he says a second time, Simon, son of, son of Jonah, do you agapeo me? Say it a second time. Do you give me your whole heart unconditionally? He says, I, I don't. I really like you, man. I really like you. <sighs> Simon Peter... Dude, tell the dude what he wants to hear. Do you love me? I really like you. And then he said to him, tend my sheep. 
which is literally take care of. It's also, though, in the infinite participle, meaning it continually goes on. Don't stop. Then he says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah. Now watch what happens. The Lord now comes down to Simon's level. And he says, okay, do you really like me at least? Now he uses the word phileo. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? I really like you, man. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? I really like you, man. Take care of my sheep. And then he says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you at least really like me? And Peter was grieved. That word for grieved is not just upset. That's the same word employed to a woman who is in labor that's near death. So it's, it's, it's a groaning of the spirit, a full brokenness. Somebody who's having a memory of, I remember sitting on the dock when the guy came up to me and he told me to cast the net. And all of a sudden there's a coal of fires and I'm denying him after I said, this is a man who is so like, what did I do? I'm telling you, the dude was freaking out. That word grieved isn't just like, I'm sorry. No. This is a man in total travail and tribulation. This is a man who is realizing the decisions of his life have led him nowhere. I did it again. My whole life has been opening my mouth and putting my foot in. My whole life has been committing myself and pulling back. My whole life has been nothing but make believe. Standing on platitudes, using my strength, my whole life. I've been full of crap. Taking the easy way out. Not fulfilling the plan that God had for my life in his power, but my own. That's grieving. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know the weakness. You know what I'm about. I ain't hiding from you anymore. I really like you, man. And the implication is, if you give me the strength, I'll love you like you deserve to be loved. But I'm telling you, in this man, there's only so much I can give. And now he says to him again, feed my sheep. And the implication Guys, not just the suggestion or the implication, the directive. You cannot love God with everything in your heart if all you do is go to church and say, God, I love you. You must spend time taking care of your business with God. You must spend time in the Word. You must spend time in prayer. You must spend time in worship. You must serve God. It is impossible to come to a full relationship with God with the understanding of how much you need Him without going to church, serving Christ, reading the Word. It's impossible. Peter, you tried to do it in your own strength. How'd that work out for you? This is not a, a club you joined. How many of you guys have a membership to a gym you never go to? And you're happy to see the $8 a month. Yeah, $8 a month, at least I can go if I need a shower. <laughs> this ain't like that. God's not going to let you see that $8 a month. He's going to go and get you. And eventually... Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. You used to do your own thing, but you, you done screwed up now. Let me be bold and not put, this is my inflection, not God's, but this is how it's worked in my life. You messed up now, Ryan. You did it now. You stepped in a big old pile now, Ryan. You accepted me as your savior. You invited me into your life in a moment of weakness. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take it all. 
used to hear a guy used to say all the time, you know, God's a gentleman. He's not going to do in your life what you don't want him to. Ah, that was a lie. I wish I could see that guy now. Hey, remember you said God was a gentleman? Not to me, he wasn't. God, I gave him my life in a moment of weakness, and he took it. And when I turned around and tried to walk away from it, you know what he did? He took it some more. Matter of fact, he took everything until there was nothing left of me, and then he said, you want to hang out? And I said, you don't want me now. I have nothing left to give you. I'm not strong anymore. I have no more money. I have no more power. I have no more influence. And he goes, that's just my type. That's just my type. Oh. You used to do your own thing, he says in the first part of verse 18. But look what he says in the latter part. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now, just so you know, I wrote this thing down. That is a prediction of Peter's martyrdom, in case you guys didn't know. All the apostles died of martyrdom. If you don't know what that fancy word is, that means they were killed for their faith in Christ, except for the apostle John. And this is another reason why I say this was written afterward. You'll come to see it. Ciro's, uh, uh, Nero's circus in A.D. 67, that's 67 years after the birth of Christ, all the apostles were called to be, anyone that still lasts was called to be killed. They grabbed Peter and they said, you're going to be crucified. And he looked at Nero's soldiers and said, I don't deserve to die the same way as my Lord. So Nero said, no problem. And they crucified him upside down which is one of the reasons I don't like peace symbols, guys. Have you ever seen a peace symbol? It's an upside down cross. It's a weird thing. Yeah, it's broken too, the arms are. So that's why, and, and I can't say that everybody wears a peace symbol, it's anti-Christian, nothing like that. This, it's just a personal thing. Just keep somewhere in there. So AD 67, Peter was crucified upside down in Nero's circus. Now, That was the prediction of how he would glorify God. Where was I? Verse 20, And Peter, turning around, saw a disciple whom Jesus loved, following, who's the disciple Jesus loved? Exactly. Who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is it? Is the one that betrays you? Peter, seeing him, that guy, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come. What is that to you? You follow me. You ever wonder why God works one guy's plan one way and another guy's plan another way? You ever see a sister? Like, you know how many women, they, 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 they find a guy who's a total loser and then they come here with their lives completely messed up and they want to sit down with my wife and say, tell me what happened in your life. And he said, well, my, my boyfriend... Ryan, who's now my husband, he was a real loser, but God got a hold of his heart. And, and they go, oh, I hope that happens with me. And she always goes, no, you don't. I got a better idea. Why don't you find a guy who loves the Lord now? And you won't have to suffer the things that I suffered, nor the things that we suffer. Single sister, don't look at some other sister's plan and go, well, if God did that for her, What's God going to do for me? Don't, you don't want me as a boyfriend, believe me, or anybody like me. Bad thing. Amen, sister? <laughs> Brothers, God's got a plan for your life. Married couples, God has a plan for your marriage. It's all yours. And he's not going to do that guy's plan or that people's, your way. He's going to do something amazing with your life. And this is, he corrected Peter right from the start. Peter's worried about John. What about that guy? Don't worry about him. 
What I did with him, I'm going to do it. What does it matter to you? I mean, he's still getting rebuked. you got to love this guy, right? He's... Then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he wouldn't die. But if I will that he remain, what is that to you? This disciple, ready? This is the disciple who testifies these things. That's why I tell you he talked about himself in the first person. The disciple who leaned on Jesus' breast, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple here is where he says, that's me. He writes these things and he, you know, and we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books that were written in it. I want you to know something before we say amen. You know how many days the book of John covers? Twenty. In 21 chapters, the whole book covers 20 days. Yet he walked with them for three years. So the implication here, the suggestion is, if I wrote down everything that he did in three years, I'm telling you, you would not imagine. All the books in the world couldn't contain the miracles he did. Now, Mary in the garden. Last thing this is where we finish. Last thing, Mary's in the garden. She's in the tomb, right? She says, where have you laid my Savior? Where did you put my Lord? Why didn't she recognize him? He's standing right there. Now some people do this whole hocus pocus and they say, oh, here's what happened was when he was risen, he got a risen body. He got a... On the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, these people walked with the Lord for seven miles and he was talking to them. You guys remember? And they didn't recognize it was him until he lifted his hands and they saw the holes when he broke the bread. In the upper room in Luke 24, they didn't even recognize him. He was standing right next to them. And then what we just read, breakfast at Galilee, they didn't know it was the Lord. Why? Why? I want you to think about this. Was it just dark? Oh, those are all the Bible verses where he... Was it dark out? I mean, what was it? They didn't recognize... When Mary had to hear his voice. I mean, if he rose and his, and his whole visage would change, certainly his voice would change too. Now, why didn't they recognize him? Here's where our Savior becomes greater than we ever imagined to us. Here's where he becomes more special. Listen to why. According to Isaiah 52 and 14, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. This is the effects of the brutality of his beating. These are the effects of... Let me read to you. Revelation 5 and 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Zechariah 12 and 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And lastly, Isaiah 50 and 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Listen. Let's go back to a little bit of sanctified imagination. And there's this meeting in heaven. Father, the Son, and the Spirit are conversing in their own way, but let's put it in our way for a minute. And, and, and the Father God says, somebody needs to go down and redeem them. And the Lord says, these are your excellent ones. I am the master craftsman. I made them. I will redeem them. Wait a second. You know what you're asking, right? Whatever it is, I'll give my all for these people. I will love them. I will agapeo them. He says, yeah, but you will have to suffer more than any man. No problem. But you will not be able to escape 
the marring of what they do to you. They will beat you. They will nail you. They will rip the hair of your beard out so that the, the skin will come off with it. Anybody ever see a guy that wore a beard for like so long that you never seen them without the beard and all of a sudden they don't have a beard anymore and you're like, whoa, didn't even know it was you. He must have had so many scars. He must have been so beat. He must have literally been, whoa, don't even look at that dude. What happened to him? Me and my wife were watching this crazy show yesterday. What was it called? A year after year or something like that? A year later? Where they, it's like a show a year in the making, where they show somebody and they go, hey, what's your goal? In one year, I want to lose 100 pounds. They had this one girl, and some of them are so stupid. One of them is a girl who wanted a Brazilian butt lift. They're like, what are you doing on the show? Because the other girl was a girl who had this face. Um, she had like a disease that the capillaries wouldn't form. Her face was completely disformed. And like in a year, she's going to go through operation upon operation. like, why is the Brazilian butt lift girl like on the same show? as It, it was so weird. The show was so bad. But you look at the girl, and you're looking at her, and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to stare at her, because I don't want her to think I'm staring at her. But I can't stop looking at her. That's weird. You, anybody have any clue what I'm talking about? Yeah. Now, what if somebody told you, hey, guys, you could hand them out now. What if somebody told you, you would have to be scarred and marred for life in order to help somebody else. I mean, this is my face, you know what I mean? A black guy, a couple of scars, yeah, that's one thing, but to have like, oof, I, can I think about this one? <laughs> Guys, I want you to think about today's Bible study. I want you to think about what God's offering you because of what he offered us. You can come up and play a tune uh, for, uh, for um, thank you. Thank you, brother. The Lord said, do you love me? Simon said, <coughs> I really like you. I already said I love you once, and I, I, can't, I can't make believe that I'm going to do that, that I'm not going to mess up again. The Lord Jesus said, I love you, and I'm going to prove it by eternally being a slaughtered lamb, so beaten beyond disfigurement that I don't even look like a human being anymore. And when they were walking down the road to Emmaus, who knows if he had a cape on or anything like that. But here's this dude that they were used to seeing with a beard. He doesn't have a beard now. He's got scars all over his face. Goodness knows what his back looks like. We know because Thomas put his hand in his side. Come on. You want to see what my life is? You want to see what my life is? Here, put your hand in there. But, but if he's, that, see, that makes no sense to me. Because if he's God, why would he have to live like that? That was the price of our salvation. <laughs> that was the price of our salvation. If he could die for me, I, I, I'm going to have to live for him. If he chooses to go through all eternity as a slaughtered lamb, Unless you've had somebody with really bad scarring and disfigurement, you don't understand. Like, you can't wait to get to heaven. Right? I can't. If you're like me, you can't wait. Man, I can't wait to run into my Savior's arms. Man, and I know he's going to have a beard. He's going to have big brown eyes. He's going to look like, you know, like a dude in the movies. GQ, man. By the way, GQ just voted... Um, the Bible as the number one overrated book of all time, in case you read it. However, you have in your hand the representation of the body of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. 
when you do communion, the Bible says that I want you to really consider what your life is and what it's for. Lest unworthy manner you take this communion, you cast judgment upon your own self. That if you're not ready to live to say, I love, I agape you, you might not want to do this thing. Because he's going to do to you what he did to me. And he's going to take your life, all of it. And now the freedoms that you think you hold, they won't hold so dear. I have a friend of mine years and years ago who was a crackhead. He was the best athlete I'd ever seen. He had a stack of offers to colleges to play ball. And I let him stay at my house. And one day he took his shirt off in front of me and I could not believe what his body looked like from drugs for so many years. I could not, I was sick. And I was like, what happened to you, dude? And he said to me, the first time I smoked crack, I never thought I'd ever experience anything so wonderful in my life. And I spent the last eight years trying to get that back, and I can't find it. You give God your life now. Your, um, your illicit sex might not feel the same. Your, um, your drug use or your drunkenness. I'm telling you, be careful here. I have to give you that caveat warning. What I want you to do is consider the things that we talked about today. I'm going to let it, I almost said Alex. I'm going to let Maddie play a song. I want you not to, don't take this yet. Let's do this together. You who are in. Now, if you look in the front of your car, in the front, you guys not in the front row, but you guys in, the, in, in any, there's a little circle, a little squiggle in the, in, the, in the back of the chair. If this thing ain't for you, you just put that cup in there. Put that bread down and just, don't worry about it, Rocky. I promise it's there. You're going you're gonna to take it anyway. Don't worry. Just, just step on that thing. Push that aside. All right? But we'll do that together. I want you to look at it. This is, this is what he looks like. Oh, that's what I was in the middle of saying. So I'm getting to heaven. I'm going to run and see GQ Jesus. Uh-uh. I'm going to get there. And as, as, as carnal and as foolish as I am, I'm going to get them. I'm going to run right by them. Ooh, look at that dude. And what happened to you? Your sins. My sins? Son, I did this for you. Me? You. I let them do this to me for you. And I gladly do it again. Oh, man. And I spent my whole life on earth saying, yeah, I really like you. And you did this for me? It's heavy. This is a heavy, this is a heavy thing. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <sighs> Consider those things before we partake together. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. And seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Taking my 
sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. Jesus, the Lamb of God. One of the cool things about our study is Simon Peter denied the Lord three times and three times the Lord gave him opportunity to recant. And I love that. To me that goes according to 1 John 1 and 9 which says if you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I love the fact that he's always there going, no, no, we're cool. Come on now, we're cool. He says, Ryan, son of Ron, do you love me more than these? I mean, do you like preaching that much? Do you like being the center of attention that much? Do you love me more than these? I wanna, if you give me strength, I will. Here's your strength. Ryan, son of Ron, do you love me? And Ryan's grieved. Because some days he just wants to himself and he wants to just enjoy a good sin. Can I just sin today, God, and love you more tomorrow? Not the way it works, pal. Can I reconsider my vows? Not the way it works, pal. Well, I really like you. But if you give me strength, I'm going to try my best to love you. Man, that's all I wanted to hear. 